What's up, everybody, and welcome in to the Take Care of Maya discussion. I've had tons of people ask me about this case, and you know, I was not trying to be cryptic about why I'm not talking about it. I was not trying to make a big deal about it. Um, I, I just I've had cases involving some of the people in parties. There are certain things I can't talk about that I know that would be really interesting for our discussion that, you know, we just can't talk about it wouldn't be appropriate. So we're going to leave that out. And one of the ways we can do that is specifically, um, focusing on Maya's testimony. And, you know, I always say in cases like this, that the client's testimony is by far the most important testimony, especially when you're asking for $200 million, um, and, and how you try to prove it or get there. Um, yeah, I'm a few minutes late. I was trying to see if, you know, court was going to end for the day. It seems like it's not, they're getting into damages discussions with, uh, Maya's brother and father and Maya might take the stand. If she does take the stand, maybe we'll just throw that up live and discuss it live as she's discussing the damages. Um, I have a breakdown and, um, some discussion points and some clips to show from her actual testimony, which I definitely want to get into. Um, but I know a lot of people are going to be over there watching the trial live before they get here, but we are going to get to her actual testimony, which is incredibly important. I was also a couple minutes late because a bunch of people are sending me the fact that the lead prosecutor has been struck from the YNW Melly case. The judge removed her. So I did a quick short on that. That's going to be posting, um, at some point later on today, I just sent it over to the team. Um, so when we talk about this trial, in this case, hit the like button if you were one of the ones that asked about Maya or interested in hearing my thoughts on Maya. Um, and we'll we'll discuss it a couple more times as the case continues. Maybe, you know, at some part, parts during the defense's case in chief or closing arguments and before the uh, verdict. But when it comes to cases like this, we have watched a couple civil trials. We've watched Johnny Depp trial, Gwyneth Paltrow, we've watched some of this trial. Um, and there have been some other ones that we've talked about, hearings and trials. And it's very difficult to get the jury to feel what the client feels and to understand what the client understands. And the hardest part for a personal injury lawyer is to ask for damages, money damages, and prove money damages, especially when loss of life is involved because the money is not going to bring that person back. It is not going to make the situation better. But in our civilized civil justice system, it is not an eye for an eye. Um, even if the jury finds that the hospital or some individual doctor is responsible for what happened to Maya's mother, we do not have a justice system in place that allows Maya's family to go grab that doctor and serve them the same fate that they may have um, caused in her family's life. Same thing with a car accident or truck accident or DUI cases that we have where there is a wrongful death element. We don't live in a world where we say, okay, you, you, Mr. Truck Driver, changed lanes and caused the loss of life of my client. So now my client's dad gets to do that to you. It's just not the world we live in. So we have to talk about money damages. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people feel like there should be caps on money damages. Some states have caps on money damages. And in Florida, we don't have a cap of um, compensatory damages, meaning the damages they actually feel for the injuries and the pain and suffering and things like that. Uh, but there is a cap on punitive damages, which are damages to punish. And it's whatever's higher. And in this case, that would be three times compensatory damages. So they're asking for 500 or, uh, sorry, they're all asking for 50 million, I think in compensatory damages and 150 million in punitive damages. So it's three times the compensatory damages, things like that. So yes, no amount of money is going to fix it. I get it. No amount of money is going to fix it, but that is the only remedy we have to balance the scales. Yeah. Somebody said, I'm glad there's not uh, Dorothy said, I'm glad there's not an eye for an eye. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's not a civilized world that we want to live in, especially for negligence, right? It's an accident which, you know, you shouldn't get that same treatment, but you should have to pay for your mistakes. You should have to act reasonably and safely. And especially as doctors and hospitals, like we're talking about in this case, they have a duty. And if you breach that duty, there has to be a remedy. And punitive damages specifically are there to punish. 
and to make sure other doctors and other hospitals don't do the same thing if the jury does find that this is egregiously bad action by the hospital. In this case, that's the point. So it is difficult. But we've watched some plaintiffs testify. And sometimes they, people in the chat are like, I just don't believe it. I don't think it affected them that much. I don't think that, you know, this accident caused this. But I thought, I think Maya is 17 years old. This was absolutely amazing testimony by her. When she gave her direct examination and cross-examination uh, a couple days ago. And I thought she was incredibly smart. Unfortunately for her, it seems to me she's been around so much medical and legal jargon that she does a better job explaining things and answering questions and catching and listening to every word than some lawyers do. So Annie said, how so much money though? That, these are good. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, let me see, uh, Annie. Somebody said law and lumber is in the chat. What up, Rob? Yeah, he said he might pop in. Ashley just said, you know, law and lumber is in the chat. What's up, Rob? I, Rob has been doing breakdowns like every single day. So if you want a, a daily breakdown of this case, check out Rob's channel, Law and Lumber. Um, but Annie, I, I do want to talk about, you know, how much, how so much money though. We will, we will get there and we'll talk about that as we go through this. Um, but as far as her testimony goes, and I, after listening to her testimony, I was like, if she has a, I heard she might want to go to Florida state, which I think would be a good choice. I'm not going to try to sway Maya also considering Duke, which is a great school. Um, but if she, if there's law in her future, man, I can see it. I can see it because she presents very, I mean, no case is going to be as hard as this case for her to discuss. And the job she did on the stand, I mean, she presents so well, so honest. You can feel what she felt. You can understand what was going through her head, how it was confusing, how it was difficult, how it was annoying and frustrating and what she wanted and what she thought. And I mean, throughout the entirety of her testimony, I thought that she hit all of the really important points. I thought that during cross-examination, the defense counsel had some good points. And I thought she handled them. I really thought she handled them well. So let's get to, um, let me check here to see if she is on the stand. It looks like it is still her dad on the stand live. So let's jump to her direct examination from a couple days ago. And we'll be on 1.5 speed to catch as much of it as we can. There will be a couple parts that are really sad. I'll try to warn you before we listen to them of her recounting what she went through. But I got to be honest, we really can't talk about a civil case. We, we can't talk about a civil case for money damages where somebody's life was affected like this and not talk about any of the sad parts. Because when you talk about why so much money, and, I, and I'll we'll get to that now and just kind of talk about it. Um, a little bit now, Annie, so much money because a hospital that has this much money go through it and access to this much money and power and, um, treats so many people and, and presents themselves with a reputation like they do the only way. And they're actually, I mean, we've heard discussion about other people with similar situations at this hospital. They tried to bring in that evidence when some of the lawyers were talking about it. The only way to make sure they stop doing this and other hospitals will just say in Florida, see this verdict and these punitive damage come out. The only way to make sure they're not going to do this is to get enough money that makes it not worth it. Because I hate to say it. I, I wanted to post today. I mean, just talking about insurance companies, um, Pete sent me a link with like the, how much the, the CEO of each insurance company makes and like State Farm CEO made $24 million last year. While they tell us, you know, they have to hike our rates because, you know, a lot of claims and blah, 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 while CEO is taking home 24 million. There's so much money in medicine and in hospitals that if the verdict was just $10 million, they'd just pay it and move on and keep making money and keep bringing in cases and keep keeping people there for 90 days, billing for exactly what they think they have, but then saying that, you know, they're lying about the pain or it's Munchausen's by proxy or it's child abuse or making all these claims while billing and collecting for the exact problem they said they had the whole time. So if it's not enough money, it's not enough of a deterrent so that they would stop 
doing it. That's why we get to so much money. And then also the $50 million, because I don't know, what's enough money for me to put you through this with your family? I'm not saying this to you, Annie, but I'm saying you can't say this to a jury. It's the golden rule. But the reason it's the golden rule is because it helps people understand. My daughter's 10 years old. I see the pictures of what Maya's going through when she was 10 years old. There is no amount of money on God's green earth you could give me to go through what this family went through, to go through what this dad went through when his daughter was 10 years old. $200 million doesn't scratch the surface. You know what would be enough money? To buy my wife's life back, to remove everything from my daughter's memory and my son's memory that happened, which is an impossibility. So what's the number? Astronomical. That's what the number is. And again, that's part of the plaintiff's lawyer's job. That's really the part of the plaintiff's lawyer's job. Um, tons of comments here. Uh, Kimberly, hi, y'all. Just became a member a few days ago, and I'm so excited to be part of such an amazing community. Lawyer, you know, has been one of my favorites to watch for a while. Y'all are the best. Kimber, welcome. Netwoman said yesterday's chat was awesome. How the how the uh, chat came through with the likes for the Crystal Rogers case. Yes. Uh, Maria is driving from St. Pete to Riverview. I've made that drive many times. My in-laws live up in Riverview. Perfect time for the stream. Watched Emily on my birthday Tuesday. Uh, now Peter today, Rob tomorrow, sweet birthday week. Yeah, my birthday week's next week. So we're very close birthdays, Samantha. Nina loves the hoodie. Susan and Carrie are new members. Uh, let's see. Ashley, we need another live soon with you, Rob and EDB. Yeah, we'll make that happen for sure. So Laura, here's a good question. Is 220 million even recoverable? So this is a good question. And we do this a lot in certain cases that get so astronomical numbers. Like here's the real point. And I'll just cut to it because I do want to get to Maya's testimony. If they were to get a verdict for $200 million, they wouldn't collect 200 million but it would give them some serious negotiating leverage. I wouldn't be surprised if they settled the case for, what is it? I'm, I'm using eight figures. What is that? Nine figures? Yeah, nine figures, which is in the hundreds of millions, under 200. But I mean, this is the leverage you get to have huge settlements. I guarantee you, Johns Hopkins has offered big money and Maya's team has rejected it. I shouldn't guarantee you that because I don't know that, but I, that's what I would guess. Um, all right, let's get to some of this testimony here. They start out with background, of course, um, but she had so many great points that she recollected. And there's a couple just like minute here, three minutes there that we're going to play just to show you just some highlights of what a great job she did on the stand and why as a lawyer, it's so important if your client is able to do this and why your case automatically has more value if your client is able to be genuine and explain what's going on in their head and their life at the time the incident occurred. Why do they have a nurse following you around everywhere? I don't know. She knows. Sustain when she reacts. What, if anything, do you know about why uh, Bonnie Rice was following me around here? I had the understanding that Bonnie Rice, even though she was a nurse, she believed that I had an either conversion disorder. So I was like making up my disease. I don't know what child would want to pretend not being able to walk and not being able to play with her friends, but she drew that conclusion. Um, she also had some problems with my mom because she expressed these concerns to my mom. My mom knew I was not making this up. She knew her daughter. So wherever you went, so why did they have a nurse following you, Maya? And that's probably speculation, but it's not when the nurse tells you she's following you around because she thinks you're faking it. She has problems with your mom. And then she says like, what child would wake this up? What child would want this to go to school in a wheelchair? Like that makes no sense. What's going on? So again, and she did this throughout, right? I'm gonna give you some highlights, but she did this throughout. Like when the lawyer would ask the question and he didn't just want her to say, oh, I don't know why she was following me. It's like, well, what did she say? And what did that make you think as to why she was following you? And boom, she answered it. She talked about how the doctor diagnosed her with CRPS pretty early on um, before she ever went to the hospital. And every time they'd go, they'd have to explain it, even if she's been to all children's multiple times. And that was frustrating. Um, I, I thought, so here's an interesting thing to, to get with, uh, Hindsight. So while she was testifying and she talked about when they found out ketamine was working, what a relief and what a great feeling that was. So we're going to listen to her statement here about it, keeping in mind what a juror then asked later of Maya about this. And this is how you can kind of start to feel if the jury's on your side based on situations like this. So first let's hear her explain 
how great it was to find ketamine as a reasonable solution for her issue. In the drug, and I did have some side effects. I was a little bit confused coming out of it, but the confusion doesn't last long. By the end of the day, I was talking in my normal self. But uh, could you do more, more motor physical therapy using the ketamine as without it? Yes. And why was that? It's just because it alleviates my pain. It's, I mean, for the first time, something is actually helping lower that burning pain. So I wanted to try even harder in physical therapy. How did it feel finally having a diagnosis that made sense? Obviously, the diagnosis itself isn't great, but it's nice knowing what it is so you can develop a course of action to try to tackle it. Did your mom, uh, best of what you remember, start researching what CRPS was? Yes. So my mom, she's an infusion nurse, and she's pretty familiar in the medical field. So naturally, she wanted to learn all about it herself. In terms of the uh, medical analysis, if you will, for you, between your mom and dad, who would take the lead? My mom did because that was her field of expertise. So your mom uh, was kind of your home physician or home nurse? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, and a lot of great, you know, discussion about how her mom helped. Um, and so there's a question here, Nina. A lot of people have asked me, they have not loved the presentation by the plaintiff's lawyer. I will say, regardless of presentation, apologizing so much for jumping around every time you question a witness highlights and brings attention to how much you're jumping around. And the way you alleviate that is with preparation and outline. Some lawyers like to do none of it and just get up and talk. And they feel like that's the most um, conversational way. And it feels real in front of the jury. But sometimes if you do that, it can feel a little discombobulated or feel like you're jumping around. There's nothing wrong with having an outline, making sure you hit the background first, the treatment before she got to all children's, what it was like at all children's, what it was like after and what it's like now, you know, just having something broken up like that can keep you in line. So a, you don't miss anything because that's most important. You don't want to miss anything, but B it kind of keeps it in an order and lets the jury follow you along the timeline. Um, there was some discussion about uh, how risky it was, yet they still did it because the pain was that bad, which I thought was interesting as well. And something I think the jury's got to think about, especially when, you know, because of how risky it is, that's why they tried to argue it was child abuse. And she was teaching Polish. Mm -hmm. And would she take you to different events and places, driving places? Yes. And was she helping you with your piano? Yes. And was she helping you through ballet? Yes. Okay. Did you have a good relationship with your mom through this? Yes, I always did. How about the fact that she wanted you to try some of these therapies that were hurting you? Did that harm the relationship? Or? No, it didn't. Because again, you have to remember, at this before we went to Dr. Kirkpatrick, we didn't know what it was. So I think her willingness to try everything was actually a sign of love. How did your dad react to finally hearing that this was CRPS? I mean, mixed? Or... I mean, no parent wants their kid to have like a chronic illness. Um, so they were sad, but I think at the same time, they were just happy to hear a definite answer. And how do they react to you telling them that after these ketamine infusions that it helped? They were so happy to know that, you know, something was helping. Finally, like one thing we try is actually doing something for me. And if you think back to the juror questions that happened at the end of Maya's testimony, one juror asked, it must have been such a relief to finally find something that worked with the ketamine treatments and then continued on and asked their question. But they wrote that in there which to me shows they're listening to Maya, they're understanding what she went through, and they're understanding that, or they believe ketamine actually worked, which is a big you know, question here because the defense is adamant and focusing on the fact that it didn't hurt work. She was worse off when she got to the hospital, better off after. She hasn't done ketamine since, and she's better off now because of it. And I think that that's an interesting argument to make. And something else I wanted to say about her testimony is sometimes... Defense attorneys in these situations and in injury cases and medical malpractice cases, they want you to think about the case abstractly and just like as some kind of philosophical or educational discussion without names and faces and feelings to it. But once a plaintiff gets on the stand, it becomes real. You see a real person and life that it affected, not just words, not just documents, not just medical records, but you see the person that this is affecting. And that is when a jury has to look them in the eye and say, was this appropriate what they did to you? Were they reasonable and wrong? Or should they have done something different? And did what they did in this situation make you worse and actually cause you damages? Roseanne asked the question, what if it was, or sorry, what if it wasn't malpractice and it was just Munchausen by proxy? Did they rule out Munchausen by proxy? So here's what I'll say. If the jury finds it was Munchausen by proxy, then the plaintiffs lose and there was no medical malpractice or, you know, imprison, wrongful imprisonment or things like that. But 
it seems like even the hospital at this point agrees it was CRPS. And after the fact, they've said it was CRPS. And it seems like everybody agrees at this point that it was CRPS. They're not trying to argue it was Munchausen by proxy. Now, they said at the time it was reasonable for them to believe that. And that's why they acted some of the way that they did. But I don't think they're trying to make that argument right now. Horse welfare. FYI, for the chat, I'm a victim of blatant medical malpractice. When there are micro caps, uh, the harmed patient often gets $0 or debt after paying the lawyers, medical expenses, and any liens. So we have cases in other states, and those states have caps. And putting caps, to me, is one of the most illogical things you can do. Because the caps should be the human being sitting in the juror's chairs. And if the juror thinks that the person doesn't deserve that, the juror gets to pick the number. And so if the juror thinks, if these six people are eight or 12, or depending on what your jurisdiction is, however many people you have no clue who they are, horse welfare, they don't know who you are, they're sitting in that chair, and if they believe your case is worth X amount of dollars, for some legislator somewhere that was paid by lobbyists of insurance companies where the CEOs make $20 million a year to put some arbitrary cap on someone's life or someone's pain and suffering, is abominable, in my opinion. It's an injustice. It's so incredibly unfair. It's not like these are six of your buddies up there in the jury box making this decision. These are people who have no clue who you are. They're listening to what you've been through. They hear the opposite side by defense lawyers. It's wild. There are also caps on what people can afford, right? If I tell you, you know, Joe Schmo owes me a million bucks and he doesn't have any money, well, there's a cap. He can't pay it to me. I'm never going to get it. But that's not what's happening here. And that's not what happens with some of the arbitrary caps that are set. P-Hop, she is well-versed. Glad the other lawyer was respectful to her. He was probably impressed as well. I agree. I thought he was respectful. Um, Chief Shenanigan said, I probably won't make another uh, live for a while. So happy birthday, Peter. Thank you for always keeping us informed and entertained. Well, I hope everything's okay, CSO. Um, I hope to see you back soon. Nirvana. Uh, civil cases, the jury asks questions of the witnesses. Please explain. Yeah, a lot of courts in Florida allow that in criminal and civil cases. I love it personally because it gets you into the head of the jury. You kind of know what they're thinking and where they're leaning um, as the case continues. Um, so I, I love it. And it just it depends on the judge and the jurisdiction. Some, some states disallow it. Some basically force it. Uh, Florida, it's kind of a judge by judge thing. Netwoman. I know that this case is difficult. Um, to do this case, I really appreciated the kind words you said to me on last week's live. I have had CRPS for 22 years. I was shocked to see this case come out and that there are other people whom have heard of this condition. It's amazing that people have gotten the diagnosis in less than six years. Netwoman, I will just tell you this. First off, thank you, as always, for your over generosity um, and the support you give the channel. I will just tell you, the amount of people including Rob, you can ask Rob this because I know people have reached out to him that have gone through this, have similar issues that she has, have been misdiagnosed to a much lower level than her, by the way. And the awareness this is bringing to it is great. But just imagine, I don't know how old you are. I don't know how, how old you were 22 years ago. Imagine being 10 years old and your number one protector and nurse mother is trying to help you with this incredibly painful condition. And the hospital removes her, abuses you from your point of view, right? I think we can agree. Maya absolutely believes she was abused in that hospital while going through this incredibly painful disease. Maybe disease is the wrong word, condition. I think we've established I'm not a doctor. But, I mean... The damages are not astronomical to me. If the jury agrees this was medical malpractice, the damages are astronomical. So thank you, Netwoman, for your support always. And all your questions in the chat are always great. So thank you for that. Okay, let's get back to it. Or we're not going to get any of Maya's testimony here. I know there's a lot to talk about because you guys have had weeks worth of questions for me. I want to answer as many as possible as I always do. But I do want to talk about some of her testimony. Um... There was discussion of mom giving her ketamine at home and whether or not, you know, that was abusive and things like that. So let's listen to a little bit of that. Funny. Um, it's not your normal self. Okay. And 
then tell the jury whether the best of your knowledge and for everything you saw, heard, felt, your mom ever gave you IV ketamine at home? Never through the IV, no. How did she give it to you? It was orally administered, which was okay by the doctor and everything. It tasted a little bit weird, so at one point I asked her to add Gatorade to it, so it's just easier to go down. And but the prescription itself, and if you're aware, great. If you're not, it's okay. The prescription itself, what did it, what did it read? Did it say oral? Did it say intravenous? Did it say? The you could take it either way, but the point is she didn't, and that was one of the ways they tried to say her mom abused her. Okay, trigger warning here for people. We are going to listen to her just for about two minutes talk about the last interaction she had with her mom, the last discussion they had, and we're going to listen to it. And we're going to listen to it on 1.5 speed. I'm not trying to overly dramatize it or anything like that, but you really have to understand what people go through. And it's not just what happened to her mom afterwards or the relationship she no longer got to have with her mom, but how the hospital didn't, you know, give an appropriate goodbye or didn't care enough about Maya. Even, I mean, if they thought her mom was abusing her from Maya's perspective, a goodbye would have still been fine. It wouldn't have been further abuse. They could have been there. And to me, like this just gives you a little feeling of what she went through. And the, somebody messaged me today. I was like, Hey, I can't watch this case. It's so heavy. Um, I just can't do it. And I'm like, I totally understand that. So many of the cases we talk about are heavy, but for people to say, and, and Annie, I want to, I appreciate that question so much about why so much money. Um, and I'm not condemning you for asking it because so many people have that question, especially when I'm picking juries, every hand goes up thinking there should be a cap on damages until we discuss it a little bit more. Um, and this is how we discuss how it affects people. This is how jurors come up with dollars and how it affects them, the pain and suffering, what they went through, how this, you know, treatment or malpractice made it worse, how relationships were broken, how relationships were lost. That's how they determine value. And it's, it's a gray area. It's not like, here's a receipt. Here's how much I had to pay. And that's what you give me back. And so that's why it's important for us to discuss these elements. So we understand what it was like for her and what she went through. So that if the number is big at the end, people aren't like, oh, this is an injustice. What are they going to do with all that money? It's not going to bring her mom back. Correct. But this is the only way to try to prevent this from happening in the future and to deal with the carnage that was left over after these actions, if they're proven, if the jury agrees with the plaintiff. Uh, them about the symptoms. Do you recall them questioning you at all about your symptoms? No. So what happened after that, uh, to the best of your knowledge? Did you stay up, go to sleep, what? Um, well, like I said, there wasn't ever a specific time where I saw the doctors and nurses ask my mom to leave. It was only because this was the day that she had to go to work. And that was my last conversation with her. Whereas with my dad, I vividly remember people coming in and telling him that this was his last time to say goodbye to me. So was this the last time you saw your mom? Uh, the last time I saw my mom, my dad wasn't there. Um, I was laying in the bed. This was while you're in your room. Did you still in the PICU. Still in the PICU. Still in the PICU. Yes. So this is pretty close to when you checked in. Yes. Yes. I, was, I know I was still in the PICU. Um, my mom was like picking up her work bag and just like little things she had brought to the hospital. And she said, I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. And I never saw her again. Need some water? Yeah. Um, I noticed you're wearing a necklace. Why don't you explain that? Yeah. So, um, so December 10th was my birthday. I turned 11 and I was unfortunately still in the hospital at the time. Mm -hmm. And the hospital has this program where they collect funds um, for children who are still in the hospital on their birthday. I was given $20 to spend. And um, I remember the social worker came in and she asked me what I'd like to buy. I bought a Nerf gun for my brother. I bought my mom a necklace. And then I bought my dad his favorite bag of mints because I didn't have a lot of money left over. But then my Aunt Wendy bought him this little glass Christmas tree and we just said it was for me. Um, but I bought my mom this very specific necklace that says I love you to the minute back. It's just like she always said that to me. Um, and then... I found out later that she wore it every single day. And when she was found in the garage, she was still wearing it. They have it on my neck right now. Have some water. Yeah, sorry. Get it. Can we publish uh, 27, excuse me, 2571001? So in case anybody's wondering, right, we've had some, some trials in the past where people have wondered if tears are real, if somebody's acting, if somebody's making it up or forcing it or practice this. I don't think we're going to have any questions about that here. Um, and 
when lawyers prepare witnesses, okay, because there's a lot of discussion about this in cases, when lawyers prepare witnesses, they don't tell witnesses what to say. Good lawyers, when preparing witnesses, they ask them questions. A lawyer would never know this about her mom. They would never know the necklace story unless they're asking questions and she tells this story and they're like, that's, that is something that's going to be impactful to this jury to understand your, the relationship with you and mom, the love you guys had, the anti-abuse, because you got to realize they're accusing this mother of being abusive and she has this type of a relationship with her. They couldn't be more wrong or dead wrong in Maya's mind. And these types of stories and details help explain that and what this did. And again, the plaintiff's theory is that because of what the hospital did, that's what took the mother's life. And that's how it affected Maya. That is the theory of their case and where these damages come from. And this is just a snippet of it. She did such a great job throughout her testimony explaining this stuff in a way only she could because it affected her life. Her dad, her brother, nobody can explain it like she could. Ian, do you watch the jury, Peter, to see if the testimony is coming across? So yeah, during, so usually if I am doing the director cross, I'll try not to watch the jury. If I'm sitting at counsel table and somebody else is questioning the witness, I'll watch the jury some. Um, cause yes, you can get an idea. I mean, obviously during opening and closing, I'm watching the jury. Um, and you know, they're nodding with you sometimes and you can, you, sometimes they're very straight faced, but many times they can give you kind of an indication. Uh, Creed. How is the hospital liable for Beta's actions to unalive herself? Would the hospital be li liable if Beta did some something to somebody else? So again, that's something they have to prove. And they have a letter in this case that specifically states why she did what she did. Frankly, as horrible as it sounds, Maya got out not long after. So I think the plaintiffs could probably argue she was right. It was the only way to get Maya out of the hospital's clutches. Um, and therefore, the hospital's actions caused this action. Now, I think there's an argument against that as well. I think she made an intentional decision herself. It was a horribly sad decision. Um, and I think the defense is going to argue there were some things in her past potentially that could have attributed to that. And it's going to be a jury question. They're going to have to make that horribly difficult decision. But I mean, I think there's so much about what the hospital did to Maya from Maya's perspective that I don't think it would be too far of a reach to potentially think it caused um, caused Beta's actions as well. Courtney, happy birthday, Libra buddy. Mine is today. Happy birthday, Courtney. Horse welfare. Are you aware that Kaiser Permente forces members into an arbitration system that denies members court trial? Imagine if uh, J Hatch owned arbitration. So I'll tell you right now, they. Well, <laughs> this is where we. This is where we have some issues. Um, about discussing this case. I'll just tell you, a lot of places and a lot of companies force arbitration and force arbitration agreements. EDB is in the chat, really? Oh, we started a hello chat. Good to see you all. Yeah, me and EDB, have, we hung out a couple times since last time she was in the chat. And I I, I won't turn this into like a EDB situation, but I, I was telling people at VidSummit like how nobody's better like leading the pack of of YouTube lawyers and introducing people to other people and making connections than EDB. She's, she's awesome. And I won't forget that ever. Nirvana, sadistic to keep her from her mom. How quickly she was released after her mom expired. The hospital taking away her rosary, prayer book, just cruel. CPS lady, I'll be your mom insane. I agree. And we're going to get to some of that. We're going to get some of that. Netwoman said she wrote more. I think I started. Let me see if I did. Yes. I just want to say that CRPS is lifelong with no cure. Um, if there is ever changing symptoms with no textbook answer and the remedies only mask the symptoms, you feel different types of pain. It's, it sounds absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. No doubt about it. And I think the jury's getting a good understanding of that. All right, back to her testimony. Um, All right, so surveillance cameras and how weird that was. So there are so many weird things happening in the hospital that I think anybody looking at would be like, what the heck is the hospital doing? 
these people being alone with her as adults and her being a child, telling her they want to adopt her, kissing her, seeing her with room, like on the cheek and stuff. Let me make that clear. Uh, getting in the chapel where there are no cameras with her, having secret cameras on her that nobody agreed to or nobody knew about. Now, there are situations where they potentially can do that to see if they're faking or abuse or things like that, but it doesn't seem like they followed the proper protocols here. And we're going to see some of the patient's rights. But first, let's hear her describe a little bit of that um, strange behavior by the hospital that, again, I really don't think a jury is going to like that the hospital is doing this. Um, and that's the point is the, the totality of the hospital's actions is something the jury is going to consider. Not just, not just one diagnosis. Was it reasonable or not? Yes. You know, somebody to talk to, somebody you could, like a better term, play with. Well, it's a children's hospital, so there's plenty of kids all around. I, um, again, I went to the rec room. So for people who don't know what that is, it's just like a playroom. You could do activities. Um, there's volunteers there. Um, so I remember going down there. Nurse wheeled me down, uh -huh. and I was just working on some art project. I don't remember what, but this really sweet social girl. She came over to me and she just started talking to me. How old? Would you, would you... She was. She looked around my age. I would say, or maybe a little bit. Actually, younger. Sorry, my bad. Younger for certain. Um, and her mom noticed that she came over to me a lot and was talking to me. Whoops, sorry, I skipped it. This is the second part, which we can talk about that too. How they they so the end of that story is, by the way, she's she's meeting some other girls on her, and I've oh gosh, I gotta tell, keep all personal stories out of this basically. But um, she was talking to another girl on her level, and basically staff saw that and said she's not allowed to talk to any other people there. So they remove her mom, they don't let her priest do things with her. That sounded bad. Um, uh, religious activities. They just basically, you know, supervised visits from her dad, all sorts of isolation, including even to the other kids that are there at the hospital with her. But let's listen to this camera story here. Seven. I stayed on seven a lot. I had multiple different rooms, even though their policy is every 30 days, you switch a room. I think I had, I mean, I stayed there over 90 days, but I had way more than three rooms. And these rooms had surveillance cameras. And when I was placed in those rooms with the surveillance cameras, I was told that to not worry about them, they don't work. So now if we could, there's been uh, allegations here. That Which was not true. And we have footage from those surveillance cameras. You were uh, outside your room 95% of the time. Can you tell the jury whether that's true? That's not true at all. Most of the time I was in my room. There were times where I went to PT, which I was outside my room. And there was a few occasions where I went to the rec room. Um, but for, I would say the majority of my time I was kept in my room. And was there, did the rooms have the kids that were there, their names on the door or next to the door? So at one point I started to get wheeled out into the hallways and whatnot. Um, and that's when I was going to PT or the rec room. Uh -huh. And I noticed something really weird was that all the other rooms on the floor, they had name tags. It would say the patient's name and just the last initial. Whereas with mine, I just had a sheet of paper in there with color coded stickers. I asked the nurses what the color corresponded to and what that meant and why I didn't have a name. And they would not tell me. I asked multiple nurses and all of them said, I can't tell you. Interesting and strange. And again, think about this. So maybe you wouldn't tell a kid, you know, that kind of information. She's 10, 11 years old, whatever it may be. But think about a kid that doesn't have a parent there with them. I mean, this stuff is brutal to think about as reality. This really happened. So anybody that has kids, if this was your kid, what would you be doing? Literally sleeping at the hospital. I broke my leg when I was like 15 years old or something. And it was a bad break, compound fracture. I had multiple surgeries. My parents were literally at the, I was a 15 year old boy. Okay. Like almost a man, basically it sucked, but I wasn't like, nobody was doing anything to me. Like there was nothing inappropriate going on. I would have shut that down quick. I wasn't a 10 year old girl. And my parents were there every second of every day. Friends were there. Friends slept in the hospital with me. Like it was, it was nonstop. Now I realized the, the allegations, how this came in, it was a little bit different, et cetera. But like, I didn't have to ask a single medical question. My mom, who's a nurse, aunts who are nurses, grandmothers who's a nurse, they're asking a million questions, making sure everything's okay. If my name wasn't on there and they were bringing me wrong information or putting cameras up, like your parents are your protectors. And they were completely removed from the situation. Now there were court orders involved which I understand, mandatory reporting, which I understand and in behind. But it was a wild set of circumstances, the isolation they were able to create in this case as the hospital. And again, punitive damages, I think, will change the way hospitals look at this. And you know what's maybe theoretically by the book, something you could argue within the law that's appropriate versus what they should have actually done in this situation. And that is part of this case as well. Um. Okay, now let's jump ahead a little bit 
to when they discuss the patient's rights. And we're going to pause it on this because they talk about this for a little bit. It was really weird. So I had to have the door open and they would have to watch me because they were afraid that I would cut myself. I wasn't allowed to have a razor. Later, I was able to have a razor to shave my legs, but I just never felt good about myself. And it says here, a patient has the right to know who's providing services and who's responsible for your care. Was it ever explained to you who was the person, other than Captain Beattie, most responsible for your care? No. And so it says that uh, you have a right to know what rules and regulations apply to your conduct. Did anybody discuss that with you ever? No. Were you ever shown any of these rules and regulations or rights? No. All right. Did you uh, receive any information from the Johns Hopkins nurses or the doctors uh, when they visited you about what diagnosis and, and what their, their plan was for you? So I, they never told me straight up. They never said, we think you have conversion disorder. They never said, we think you're- And I think it's, it's like very becoming of her that- um, when she's talking about this, she says things like straight up or that's my bad. It's like, you remember she's a kid and uh, those types of comments come out when kids are discussing these things. So even though she's so well put together and eloquent and understands the medical and legal jargon better than most, you know, adults do, it, it still just reminds you she's a kid when she's up there saying they didn't tell me straight up or it was my bad and things like that. Your mom has my child by proxy. Instead, they would give me like little clues in the things that they were saying. So for example, when I expressed to them a symptom or like my pain, they would say, no, you're making it up or it's in your head. Um, and then. So just imagine that they never told her oh, officially it's Munchausen by proxy. That's what we're diagnosing you with, not CRPS. Um, so just so you understand what, no, they're like, this is in your head. You're making this up. Um, so they're planting these things in her head, which again, a lot of kids would start to believe was true. Um, and totally inappropriate and wouldn't happen if your parent was there. And at one point, the social worker, Kathy Beatty, said that my mom was in a mental institution, um, making me think that something was wrong with her. And I asked my dad and it turned out to be a lie. Imagine that. And this Kathy Beatty was the one, you know, doing a lot of other inappropriate things with her as well. But just imagine that. By the way, if I keep messing with my lip, it's because Maverick split my lip last night while we were wrestling. He need me in the in the mouth. Um, so they were trying to even manipulate me into thinking that my mom was sick and therefore making me sick even though it wasn't true. Well, as the allegations of much as by proxy, which are that your mom or dad are intentionally trying to keep you sick. Did any of the doctors or nurses ever simply ask you about your relationship with your mom and dad? No. And as a matter of fact, they always told me what went down in my house. Dr. Elliot, he said that my mom was putting me in a coma every single week. And I told him no, but even though I told him no, he wouldn't accept that as an answer. Did they seem to have their own story they wanted told? Absolutely. No doubt about that. And so then it says a patient has a right to refuse any treatment. Um, were you ever given any right to accept or reject the physical therapy? No. What was the problem with that as time went on with the physical therapy? So even though physical therapy, like done in a certain way, does help CRPS, when you don't listen to the patient, it's actually going to be more harmful than beneficial. So my condition just went downhill. I mean, when I got back home after being released, it was, it was nasty. So a couple things there. Number one, I realize she's a kid and you can't just believe and do everything kids ask for. Um, I, I have two kids, you know, I understand sometimes they exaggerate or whatever it may be when her parents you've removed from the situation and you only have the kid, you've got to listen to them a little bit more. And it seems like they didn't listen to her at all. And they didn't ask what the relationship was like. And again, victims of abuse sometimes don't feel like they're being abused and will argue to still be with their mom. And I get all that, but to totally disregard what she said to me is really wild. Um, Rebecca said, Hey, late. Did you see what the defense mess up with almost mistrial? Yeah, there's been a lot of almost mistrials and a lot of it has to do circulate circulating and, and being around DCF and what they did and what they didn't do and court orders and things that have already been summary judgmented out, but it doesn't seem like anything has been enough for a summary judgment yet. Rodina, Peter, what do you think of the hospital lawyers trying to use DCF as a sword and a shield? And in my opinion, hiding behind DCF immunity and their mandated reporter status. So I can't really comment too much on this. I will just say it's not unusual. Um, decibel is, is it a difficult thing as a lawyer to establish the dollar amount of damages in cases such as these? Yes. I argue this is the most difficult thing. Arguing non-economic and punitive damages to jurors. You have to help shape how they view this and why we have the system that we have and why it's fair for money to replace eye for an eye and why we have money as the remedy. Not that it's going to make all the pain go away. Not that it's going to bring mom back but it's the only way we can in a civilized society balance the scales 
make people whole, and deter further conduct of similar nature by similar defendants for all those different types of damages. And the only way to really do that is to, to make them understand and feel what these clients go through. Lady Law said, don't like caps. McDonald's suit doc explains this. Dawn of time. Peter, can the defense decide to settle in the middle of this proceeding? Does the trial continue or do they just stop mid-trial? Yes, you can settle at any time. You can settle after a verdict. A lot of cases settle after a verdict or while the jury is deliberating. Absolutely, you can settle any time. I don't expect that in this case. Most cases do settle. I think the plaintiffs in this case, they settled the case for $2.5 million against one of the doctors that we saw her deposition, I think, today. Um, and so that probably funded the case, pays for all the experts and things like that. I think they want to prove a point with this. I think they expect a huge verdict. Um, and, and I think they do want to make change. I think Maya and her family want to make change. Crazy cat queen, Peter, how do you get through such heart wrenching answers as Maya without breaking down yourself? The first time you hear things like this. So I will tell you, I'm not a very sensitive person. Um, but there have been multiple times in closing arguments where I have gotten choked up explaining what a client's gone through. Now I try not to, and I think it's appropriate not to, but the way I would get choked up is not, you know, just bawling, crying, but you can just kind of tell on my voice if it'll start to shake. Um, and I don't have a shaky voice generally, but sometimes that'll happen. And you know what? I, I don't, I've never gotten objected to. I'm, I'm never putting on a show. Nobody's ever thought, like when you hear about Murdoch crying in his closing arguments, right? Never been accused of that. I don't even know if defense counsel knew I got choked up. I just know what's going on inside of me. And it happens. It absolutely happens. And I've seen jurors cry. Um, during cases in the jury box, it happens. This stuff is so sad. Chris K. Peter, did they contact the lawyer as soon as they were isolated? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I haven't watched the doc. That woman just doesn't stop. She's wild. Have you seen that meme? Um, the dirty dancing meme when uh, they're in the car driving and uh, baby's like, you're wild. And the wind is rolling in like it's a meme that says like my husband when he decides to stop at Starbucks on the way uh, to the airport. That's what I feel like I'm doing with Netwoman. Like, you're wild. You're just wild. Uh, Brooklyn Basement, if DCF BD already held liable, how can JH B2? So different actions by different people. I don't know that DCF was held liable, but I don't know. I don't know the entirety of this case and everything that's happened in it. But um, different people can be liable for different things. They can be liable for different percentages of damages. There can be set-offs based on what defend one defendant already paid and what the verdict ends up being. There can be a Fabre defendant. Um, which is like you say, well, we point the finger and we think this person's actually liable. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that this can be handled, but it's not just one person that's liable for each bad act. Roro, how many hours does each side have? I honestly, I do not know. I, I haven't been keeping track of their hours, but I know Judge Carroll does do that through trial and will hold them to it. Chelsea, had her parents refused to leave, what would have happened? Potentially they would have been arrested, literally trespassing, abuse, obstruction, interference, Blade Runner. Thanks for the super chat here. Michael K., if she wins, can the staff members lose their licenses? Not necessarily. It's not like a one-for-one, one, but they could based on these accusations and actions the hospital decides to take. All right. Um... Let me see here next. So I saw court ended for the day and she did not testify. So we didn't miss anything from there. Um, all right. Some more discussion about planting the idea in her head. Fortunately at 10 years old, she can't perform the charade effectively 24 seven and doesn't even know if she's making physiological mistakes. So things like this. Being able to perform this. Yes. Okay, one second. Talks here about you being 10 and not being able to perform this charade effectively. Uh, were you keeping up a charade, Maya? Not at all. And so he might ever come into you thinking back to the patient's rights and explain to you that they were concerned that you were making all this up? No, they never told me that, but they did tell me frequently that it was all in my head. So they just planted the idea there instead of questioning me about it. So again, great explanation by her. Just absolutely great. And here's some more of the weird accusations from Beatty things in the hospital and all of the pictures I'm wearing shorts. So, okay. Uh, she also reported she now has RSD, CRPS, skin lesions in her hands and forehead. And says that the usual reasons 
what's the date of this? This is December 30th, 2016. I've been through now two months of lesions. Um, really top of that page. Yep. Top of the next page, I believe. So just not let me examine. Self-inflicted excoriations. Do you even know what a self-inflicted excoriation is, Maya? No, at the time I had no idea what that meant. Um, but again, the doctors were telling me I, it was all my fault. I was doing this to myself. Well, uh, did they ever ask you whether you were self-inflicting these lesions? They just told me, they never asked. And then when they told me and accused me of self-inflicting the lesions, I told them, no, it's just part of the CRPS. Uh, and I'm interested to hear when the defense calls their witnesses, are they gonna say, that she actually was self-inflicting these, right? Really interesting. So Rebecca, CPS has sovereign immunity. Sure, but they can still be sued and you can break through sovereign immunity caps a bunch of different ways. And cases like this are the ones that usually do it, but it doesn't sound like that happened here. But again, I'm not positive what's happening in other litigation outside this trial. Um, are we on uh, 2116, page 001? So this whole time they were not documenting your, your lesions, other than to say that now you're scratching yourself? Correct. Okay, now well, here's a series of, uh, I believe, texts, messages back and forth. And if we could focus on anyone, were they suspicious of your mom and dad at this time? Yes, yeah, so there was this whole ordeal with um, Kathy assuming that I was emailing my mom. So my teacher, Jackie Dieter, she came over to the hospital and I was given a laptop for school purposes exclusively. And um, most people don't know this, but with the school email, so I only had a school email, which is like your end number, which is what you use to log in. And then it's whatever school um, county you're at net. So I could only send emails to people within the school district. That meant teachers and students. That is it. I could not receive any external emails. As a matter of fact, the whole system itself blocks external emails and you cannot send external like emails to people outside of the system. Again, it blocks it. It will not let you. So there was this nurse who um, was in my room when I was on my computer trying to do homework in school. And she noticed that I was on the email portion of the platform. She immediately went, grabbed Kathy, told Kathy I was probably trying to contact my mom. Kathy came back into the room. She said that I can no longer have my computer because she was in fear that I was browsing sex websites. Did you know what a sex website was at 10 years old? I didn't even know what sex was. Like very weird, number one. Number two, again, just stack this stuff up blocking people from coming to see her, blocking from her from talking to other patients, blocking her from even having access to school email. It's not normal. When, when you have a situation like this, you can track that stuff. You can say, let me see your email. Like th there's, you can tell the school, we're not letting her talk to her mom. So monitor her email, make sure she's not emailing her mom. They, they take it to like such an nth degree that just makes you side eye. Apparently she was introducing this concept. Yes. So let's talk about your relationship with Kathy Beattie. Was she there on just one floor so that if you switch from one floor to the next floor, you got somebody new? So it's pretty like standard practice that whenever you move floors, there's like a social worker per floor. Um, but weirdly enough, Kathy Beattie literally followed me wherever I went. Except for the time assigned to the end, she was there? Yes. Okay. And how would you describe her interest in you? Was it the normal interest of a nurse or social worker? Or was it something, what if anything was unusual about Kathy Beattie's? approach to you. I've, I have a lot of stories about Kathy Beattie, uh, so it's going to take some time to go through them all. But there is the whole chapel incident where a nurse wheeled me down to the first floor where the chapel is located. The nurse left when Kathy Beattie approached me. Kathy Beattie then kissed me, said, I'm not trying to be your mother, but I can be. Then she wheeled me into the chapel. And at this point, you know, I was so excited to finally be able to go to the chapel. And she just destroyed all of my excitement. She picks me up, puts me on her lap. She sits in this tan chair at the back of the chapel. Um, there's a photo of that. Um, and she just sat with me there. And then I told her I was done praying. I was very quick in there because I just wanted to go back to my room. Um, and then I was put back into my room. There's many instances, this numerous occasions like, that she lifted me up and put me on her lap. She like clawed through my hair. Um, I was close enough to her almost like at all times to the point where I knew she had permanent eyeliner. That's not something like, you know, unless you're really close to a person. Um, she would tell me like weird details about her life. Um, yeah, let's go 27, 25, uh, inappropriate. I don't really care if they've banned your parents, but that wouldn't happen if your parents were around, I would guess. Um, yes. And there's some, again, amazing hospital staff and medical staff, and we're not at all condemning them as a whole, but I mean, it's, it's, this stuff is not appropriate. It's not appropriate. And again, when your parents aren't around is when stuff, I mean, we know this, that's like common sense that parents are the protectors. Um, talked about how Kathy would 
get mad at her if she didn't do certain movements. Okay, so here's another interesting little quick tidbit that she talks about how there was a couple times where she could talk to her mom on the phone. Of course, I had to be supervised. And Kathy, I believe it was Kathy, was sitting right there the whole time. Um, and she would interrupt sometimes or cut off conversations, which is fine for somebody to be monitoring the phone calls if the mom's been accused of this. I totally get that, and that's not lost on me. But listen to where she interrupts her, which again, we'll talk about why this is inappropriate. So you can't obviously see it on the audio recording, but I, when I tell you, like every single time I had a conversation with my mom, she'd be rolling her eyes like that, or she'd be making faces or sticking out her tongue. Like she was acting like a toddler. Let's play uh, B, 2608B. Um, how, how about, how are you doing? How is PT and OT going for you? I'm not good. How is PT and how is OT going for you? Physical therapy and occupational therapy. How's that going for you? Meaning like, are you getting better? Her mom wants to know, is the treatment working? How are you feeling? Are you getting better? Um, okay. Bianca, we can't discuss any of those type of matters. Okay. Okay. And Kathy pipes in and says, Beata, we can't discuss any of those matters. Okay. First off, I understand. Um, Rebecca said, got to go save some lives. God bless Rebecca. Go do God's work there. Um, speaking of people in healthcare, uh, so I understand monitoring. I understand making sure there's not abuse going on. I understand all of that. What does PT and OT and how she's doing have anything to do with that? Beata's not affecting her medical treatment, not affecting her condition, doing nothing abusive there. She didn't say PT and OT is horrible. It's never going to help you. It's only going to hurt you. I could understand if she would have cut her off there. But why can't she tell her mom how PT is going? And especially, I think what was interesting is Kathy did not cut it off until uh, Maya said, bad. It's going bad. Then she cut her off. Not good. Not appropriate. And then, okay, so I mean, this is like something that you do with a very sophisticated client, right? Because you know one of the arguments that the defense makes, and we'll talk about cross briefly, it wasn't a very long cross, but they're going to argue like, you're doing so much better with no ketamine treatments, nobody to force you to do anything. Um, you know, so that's been a big argument is like, actually, maybe it was Munchausen by proxy, which we'll get to a comment later. Maybe it wasn't CRPS or the, maybe those treatments were abusive and making it worse. And now that you're not doing those treatments, you're actually better. Well, he asked her that question and she gives her answer here. I considered the resources and tools I had. I had to shift my entire mindset. It was so hard, but I did it. And you did it without the use of any ketamine or any other meds? I did. And why not? Why, what was your worry if you did? I was scared that I was going to end up in the same situation I just got out of. And so in terms of going to see doctors and so forth during this period to help you, um, what was your feeling about that? I didn't want to ever see a medical professional again, not even my primary care physician that I've seen forever. Um, he's such a lovely guy. And here I didn't ever want to step into his office. I didn't want to ever go to a doctor. How about agility fitness? How did they fit into this? So agility fitness, um, it's like a physical therapy center and the, I don't know if he's like the manager or I think I missed I the question. Any ketamine or any other. Here we go. It was so hard, but I did it. Andrew. I considered my God. I didn't consider what I didn't have. I considered the resources and tools I had. I had to shift my entire mindset. It was so hard, but I did it. And you did it without the use of any ketamine or any other meds? I did. And why not? Why? What was your worry if you did? And that's when she goes into the answer about she didn't want to get stuck in a hospital again. She didn't want them to take away from her family. She didn't want to take them away from her dad. She didn't want to do all that. Period. Um... And here's an interesting question here by Pink Pink Door Cat Katie. Multiple hospitals has concern had concerns of medical abuse. How can you be so quick to judge with none of the defense's case? I hope you will be less biased. I think this is a great question, Pink Door Katie, and thank you for asking it. So, if you listen to how we discuss this, I don't care what the defense says. What happened to Maya, which is why we're talking about her testimony, is horrible should never happen to a kid in a hospital. Even if her parents were abusive, which it turns out nobody ended up finding. But even if they were, how she was treated is totally inappropriate. How these medical professionals did things with her, like Kathy Beatty, totally inappropriate. How she wasn't able to talk to other patients, 
totally inappropriate. Now, did I say that they're going to win the case? No, I said, if the jury finds this, if the jury finds that, the defense can come and make an argument and say it was not medical malpractice. If you remember the opening statement, the defense said, we don't have to get it right. We just have to be reasonable. That doesn't mean nothing bad happened to Maya. That doesn't mean they've apologized to her. They've said, we were sorry for your loss. They've said also, everybody agrees in that courtroom, including the defense, that this is a traumatic event for Maya. And it's horrible. And what happened to her should never happen to any 10 year old kid. And that's what we're talking about. I'm not saying they're going to win. I'm not saying it was medical malpractice. They have to prove the claims that they've brought. And what they've proven so far to me is this was horrible what happened to Maya. Now, some of the other testimony may make you start leaning towards Maya's side. And I will tell you, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It is a preponderance of the evidence in the civil justice system. 50.0001%. This is not the same thing as a criminal case. There is not a presumption of innocence in a civil case. And if the plaintiff proves their case through their case in chief, you can make your decision. And then you listen to the defense and see if the defense pushed the bar as to over 50% is very different than a criminal case. Let's not get confused. Let's not sit there and presume that the hospital did nothing wrong. Because once the plaintiff starts to prove they did something wrong, that's evidence of proof they did something wrong. Different burdens, different cases. And Rebecca, of course, gifting five memberships on her way out. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, uh, let's get to a couple more questions. Oh gosh, we're already at the hour mark. Yeah, I gotta go soon. All right, let me hit some questions here. Nirvana said, this has been the best live ever. We created group tears in a YouTube chat, feeling the humanity today. Thank you, Nirvana. Laura, I'm so glad we're finally talking about Maya. I'm at home recovering from back surgery and I've been engulfed in this trial. Such a tragic story. Being an RN and a mom, this hits every direction. Back surgery, Laura, I'm sorry about that. That's I have a lot of clients, obviously, that go through that. It's a very difficult recovery. You know, rest is important, following doctor's orders, but then PT and getting back to what you can do and what doctors say you can do is so important. So you'll be in our prayers. Keep us posted as you recover and continue to recover. A couple other people going through surgeries as well. Um, and I love to hear the recovery stories. All right, Rodina, I saw this one and I, ch I checked it because it, it was a great question. Peter, the defense is not stipulating that it is CRPS, in my opinion. Their argument in trial implies that they still argue it was Munchausen by proxy. Uh, the depositions from today even argue she didn't have asthma. Rodina, this is an absolutely great question. And I agree with you. I think there are some things that they're saying that do imply that maybe they're better off. Maybe she is better off without her mom. And there's been questions about that. And I said that after I broke down the opening statements. But then they're getting eerily close to walking the line to giving the plaintiffs a smoking gun. If they argue that this was absolutely not CRPS, never was, this was abuse, this was Munchausen by proxy, if that's really where they want to go, then the plaintiff can once again pull out the billing records. I think it was over 500,000 dollars billed with the CPT code for CRPS. So what was it? Is it CRPS or is it not? Because that's what you build the whole time. That to me is a smoking gun. So if they really do say it's not CRPS, that's why I'm saying like, I almost feel like they have to say it and they got to go with the, listen, we did our best and what we did was reasonable even if we weren't right. Why would they say we don't have to be right if they think they were right? Why make that statement at the end of opening statements if you're the defense, if you think you are right? Just one guy's opinion. I love the question, Rodina. Thank you. And same thing with Pink Door. I love the questions. Give the questions. It's an opportunity for us to discuss, even if we disagree. Uh, Nina, why couldn't they call Kathy Beattie on the stand? I don't know. I think they could. Uh, there's got to be a reason that they haven't or that they're not going to. Uh, Lady Law Sandra, how is the amount determined by the jury? The lawyer has to come up with an ask. They've got to connect it to the testimony in a way that they think is going to convince the jury. But at the end of the day, the jury determines the amount in Florida. K Rab, I would answer Pink Door Katie's question with asking the people in the chat with chronic pain. We are all told it's all in your head and called drug seekers. And there's a chance people on the jury have those experiences or even have the same condition. Uh, J. Michael RN, core question 
is why was there not a guardian ad litem appointed? Go ahead and segregate. But there is a conflict of interest to have hospital staff name decisions. It's a great question. I don't know what happened with the whole CPS side. That to me, again, this is a highlight and a just a huge example of why the system cannot be this way, where she's just left alone with hospital staff. Somebody's got to be there where it's their primary job to look out for her and her rights. Laura, Peter, would you have wanted this case? You seem passionate AF, loving the fire. No comment. No, no. Uh, yes, this would be the type of case that we would handle. I mean, it's very different and kind of weird and unusual. Um, but these are this is in line with the types of cases that we handle. Yes. Miss Escobar, there's like a there's like a cobweb or something. Uh, day one of physical therapy today. My shoulder is screaming, but I'm heading up. The trial is horrible. Keep it up. No frozen shoulders for you, Miss Escobar. Okay, it's a common thing after shoulder surgeries, and when my clients end up with that, it's brutal. Amanda E, welcome to the crew. All right, on cross, let's hit this real quick. Um, they talk about the fact that, you know, she's not on ketamine anymore. She's doing a lot better. She's doing well in school. She's able to do more physical activity, um, things like that. And I thought it was good. Jury questions came out. They were pretty good for the plaintiff, I think. Um, was the hospital doing things that made you comfortable helping you out? A lot of Catholic questions. But real quick, just to end here on this. When I heard some of the other testimony where the hospital staff was calling her ketamine girl and saying ketamine girl, girl's mom ended her life today and how they knew that this had happened before in similar situations and almost expected it and weren't surprised when it happened and saying that she's faking it to each other, making light of it. The jury is hearing all of this and the jury's got to make a decision as to who wins at the end of the day. And they're going to pick a side and write it down on a piece of paper. And a lot of it comes down to the likability of the clients. And I will just say, and while we played Maya's um, testimony, very likable. And you all potential jurors in the chat can determine whether the defense, the witnesses that are agents of the defense thus far have been very likable. Now, we haven't heard the defense's case in chief. That's absolutely fair. And we will still listen to that. But as it goes right now, it's, it's pretty brutal. Pretty brutal. All right, we are going to wind down here. Maybe I'll hit a couple more questions on the way out, but I did want to hit this from Nicholas. Hey, Peter, not sure if it's true, but heard the prosecutor Kristen Bradley has been dismissed from the case. Can you confirm? I have seen reports as such, and I've just recorded a short before we started this video that's going to post on social medias on my quick thoughts about it and questions that I have, but we will do a deeper dive when I actually see the order to make sure um, that this is actually correct, but it seems to be correct which is wild. This is what I said I would do if I was the judge, but I didn't know if he'd have the gumption to do it or think that it would be totally unfair to the state to do it. But I think he absolutely made the right decision. And I, I kind of thought he would split the baby, meaning Christine Bradley's off, but not the entire state attorney's office. Go check out the end of our last Melly video. That's kind of what I thought was going to happen. Alexandra M. Hi from Germany. Can the jury award more than 200 million? Great question, Alexandra. I'm glad you asked. So yes and no. For the compensatory damages, meaning what happened to them, the pain and suffering and what they went through, yes, they can award a billion dollars. There's no cap on that in Florida. But for punitive damages, if they only award $50 million for compensatory, punitive damages can only be three times that. So it would be $1.5 million. I'm sorry, $150 million. So that would be 200 total. So they can't do 50 in compensatory and 500 million in punitives. They can't do that. How do you even question the jury to sit for this? Well, you make sure they don't think there should be caps on damages. Uh, you probably talk to them and see if they've had any negative medical experiences before. Anybody in their family, medical malpractice, anybody in their family have medical background, RN, doctor. You may want some of those as the plaintiff. You may not want some of those. Um, so there's a lot of different, a lot of different questions you can ask. But at the end of the day, as long as they can be fair and impartial, to me, there's a lot of people that could sit as jurors in this case. A lot of people. Laura, Peter, I would have paid good money for you to be Maya's lawyer. Uh, thanks for the well wishes, guys. I'm pretty sure I have the nurse back. That's unfortunate, but hey, at least you're doing it helping people. And, you know, your back's hurting because you're helping so many people, Laura. Thank you. Azam, I know zero about this case. Didn't watch Take Care of Maya. Question, 
Why her? Is this a special disease? Or is it that she is brave to bring it out in the open? I apologize if my question is not appropriate. Your question is fine. And I'll be honest with you. If you want just my quick crack at why her, because there's so much evidence the plaintiffs have of what happened behind, behind the scenes, the pictures, the video, the memos, the text messages, the emails. I'm not going to say this happens more often, but it's very rare to have as much evidence as the plaintiffs have in this case. Crazy cat queen. Will Peter become a judge? When will Peter become a judge? Never. Never, ever. Never, ever, ever, ever felt so low. No, not going to happen. Net woman, 20 more. And which is awesome because tomorrow is our members only live. And she's giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Now we're going to do a behind the scenes tour of the office. We're going to do a Q and a, we can talk about whatever you want. If you guys want to join the membership or if you get a free membership because net woman or cowboy, RN or uh, Rebecca or Susan, I think in the beginning gave some away. So um, a lot of new members are going to be there. Kayla, when they say she's doing much better, I get frustrated because the family had a year to get diagnosed and treated and all better. She's doing much better years later, years later, oranges and apples. I think you said not oranges and apples, but you mean oranges and apples, meaning they're not a comparison. Right. And I do think like, as you become an adult, you can learn, you know, mind over matter sometimes, and you can do things differently and you can try things differently and you can push yourself differently. And I mean, the, what's happened in this case has absolutely affected her. And maybe it's allowed her to try certain things she didn't try before or do certain things. It definitely affected her decision to not go to the hospital anymore. So maybe it's just not documented as much when she has the pain. Cause she's like, you cut my legs off. I'm not going back in a hospital and getting stuck there, which I can understand. Beldy. Could a potential juror be struck by lawyers if they reported a history of medical conditions like CRPS? Yes. This would probably be a cause struck that they're too close to the case and couldn't necessarily be um, fair and impartial. Uh, no one should say it's made up. Pain from a conversion disorder is as real as any pain, but you have to treat the mental health part too. Pink uh, door, Katie, I'm glad that you stuck around um, and, you know, understand that we can disagree and have some conversation. I actually do agree with you. So that wasn't a disagreement. I hope you didn't take it that way, but I'm glad that when people ask good questions, tough answers sometimes come. I agree with you. And, and a lot of, in, of situations have a mental component, including the damages they're asking for in this case. Physically, they're saying they made her see, uh, RPS, th those acronyms always throw me off worse but also PTSD and mental health issues that they've had as a result of everything that happened in this case. So mental um, health parts of these cases are very common. Miss Spunky, or sorry, Mick Spunky is bringing a friend as well to the membership crew and to the members only live tomorrow. All right, I'm sorry. Boom, let's go five more. All right, I appreciate all of you guys so much for joining me and talking about this. This has encouraged me to maybe we'll do a little bit more on this case, not daily. Check out Rob Law and Lumber for dailies. Um, but, but more because I really liked this conversation. I really like this conversation and you've convinced me I can do it without talking too much about the parts I need to stay away from. I can still stay away from them. And you guys all understand when that happens. So I appreciate you so much. Um, hit that like button on the way out if you haven't already. Make sure you subscribe to our channel if you want me to do more videos on this. Join the membership if you want to join us tomorrow. I'm out of here until next time. Peace out, everybody. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who might be interested here on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at Lawyer You Know. But on Instagram, we are still at Tragos Law. So look us up on there. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast, available on all major podcast platforms. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us lawyer you know at gmail.com of course all of these links i just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode so until next time this is peter tragos the lawyer you know